Good morning. This is Eric Harrison this morning. This is WFL HCA. We're glad to have you here this morning. And uh, we're going to talk about something very interesting. And uh, we have today uh, Dr. Tariq with me, who's been with me for a year now, who's been uh, the producer of this series. And so uh, we're so glad that he's put this uh, together uh, on a very interesting patient. So our mystery case of the day will start right now. So I'll give you Dr. Hassan Tariq. Hassan? Okay. Let me start out with a little bit about the patient and then uh, Dr. Tariq's going to come on. And so this is a gentleman whom I saw a couple of years ago and he's been coming to clinic. It's going to be an interesting uh, evolution of his case. And so that's what's important is on these individual cases is how each person presents and how each time physician has to come up with the, the right answers at the right time. And so um, let's talk about this a little bit. Here's a guy who's uh, referred uh, because uh, he's uh, has some irregular heartbeats. And so he's retired military. I think he's a um, government civilian employee now which is uh, a lot of people do that when they retire they do they keep their same job and they become a civilian employee or a civilian contractor and so he's had some abnormal EKGs he has a history of questionable hypertension and has found to be of LVH on an echo in 2013 uh, he's never been seen by a cardiologist before he didn't have any chest pain shortness of breath palpitation dizziness lightheadedness nausea fever uh, no symptoms of congestive heart failure, no chest pain. Here's his EKG, uh, and uh, basically the EKG shows a normal sinus rhythm. The P wave's got a negative component in V1. It's kind of a fuzzy-looking EKG, kind of a notched P wave, a prolongation of the P wave, so it makes you think uh, something's going on left and right atrium. And then we've got uh, sort of a conduction defect of some sort with a probably right bundle type configuration with prolonged QRS and then it looks like a negative axis of maybe minus 45 aiming towards minus 60 so left anterior fascicular block so it looks like some tendency towards bifascicular block PR interval appears to be upper limit of normal ST and T wave changes not too impressive and so his EKG showed incomplete right bundle left axis deviation left anterior fascicular block which is saying the same thing and uh, the interpretation of the echo that he brought with him was a severe concentric left ventricular hypertrophy wow this is pretty severe here's a wall thickness of 24 millimeters and here's a wall thickness of 22 millimeters so that would be certainly severe left ventricular hypertrophy. Upper limit of normal is 11, uh, 12 millimeters is usually borderline and uh, you can get very good at measuring these especially it's easy to measure someone who's got a 28 and a 24, uh, 22 measurements like that uh, are easy to make and so let's look at his RV systolic pressure is normal, it's injection fraction was a little down uh, and then trace MR, TR and PR so the most impressive thing is uh, the left ventricular thickness of uh, 24 and 22 and then he had a stress test that was interpreted as normal which I'm not sure with this kind of EKG how with the left ventricular hypertrophy how you could have a normal stress test but uh, let's move on and uh, so we've got hypertension and secondary changes that would be of severe hypertension. So you always go back and say, well, do you have a family history of hypertension? And yep, you know, mom and dad both have hypertension. And so then you look and uh, see what else we can find about him. His blood pressure here was 130 over 70 when he came in. And uh, he had uh, no murmurs and uh, really essentially no physical findings 
Uh, it doesn't say about his apex by palpation in terms of looking for LVH by palpation of the apical anterior wall. And here's another EKG with little arrows showing the prolongation of the P wave with sort of a double notch. And so, and here's a kind of negative component. So that looks like uh, that would be consistent with left atrial enlargement. And then again, a left axis deviation. And again, a terminal conduction delay and the upper limit of normal of a PR interval. So uh, conduction abnormalities all over the place here. Voltage for someone with left ventricular hypertrophy is okay. It depends on his body habitus. And so again, left ventricular hypertrophy, some systolic anterior motion. Question is, uh, does he have um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with a ventricle that's thus thick? But it's concentrically thick. So it's not an abnormal septum uh, to posterior wall ratio. So it's unclear if his left ventricular hypertrophy is from uh, hypertension. This would be a little extreme for an athletic heart, depending upon what kind of measurements we're getting. And then uh, there's no obstruction and a little bit of not SAM, but SAC, I guess, systolic anterior motion of a cord, uh, which uh, happens sometimes with a Venturi effect uh, at the outflow track. And so some non-calcified, obstructive, non-obstructive uh, left common carotid plaque, which is very common. And we screen for that when we're screening for atherosclerosis. And the concordance of uh, plaque in the coronaries and plaque in the carotids, it's about 35% of people with carotid plaque have coronary plaque. And the femoral artery, it's about a little, little bit more, 37% of people with femoral artery plaque have carotid, have a coronary plaque. And so he had a stress echocardiogram that was done at some point, and uh, he had hypertensive resting blood pressure, confirming the diagnosis of hypertension. Again, he had concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, and here's moderate left atrial enlargement, which goes along with the prolongation of the P wave, and it's notching some PVCs during exercise, but no complex ventricular ectopy, and uh, no chest pain. And so we're thinking, well, what's, what's the story here? Is it borderline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy with uh, some SAC but no SAM? Is it uh, pathological left ventricular hypertrophy? And there are people that get idiopathic left ventricular hypertrophy, and we have a couple of those that we see every once in a while. We don't know why their left ventricle is thickened, uh, and they have very prominent voltage but no hypertension. We usually do 24-hour blood pressure recordings to look for that. So athletic heart, it's getting a little extreme for athletic heart. We don't have the measurements here. That inducible gradient, 19 millimeters, that's probably normal. So we have a CMR, and so let's go look at our CMR. Just hang on for a minute, we'll get it up. And so when we do the CMR, we uh, do sort of a survey to start with. So here's our survey. And this is basically defining the location of the heart and the chest and uh, getting sort of gauging where we are, fixing our location of the heart so we can go through whatever sequence we decide to do on this particular patient. So we can see the heart... Uh, Location is here. Left atrium does look a little enlarged. This is really not done for anatomy, although the left ventricle looks very thick and it can make out stuff. You know, there's normal breathing taking place during this, and so there's motion artifact. There's no attempt to gait, and so but the left ventricle does look thick. Right side is chamber size or normal, and uh, sometimes we can see other things like eventration of the diaphragm paralyzed diaphragm. So we look at everything in terms of the anatomy. You see the muscular definition. So now we've sort of fixed the location, liver, spleen, 
fix the location of the heart, we can go on to the next part of our study, which is usually the black blood study. So obviously the blood is black. And so we're looking at hypertrophy of the left ventricle and thickness. So let's see if we can measure that. So we'll come over here and we'll say we'll measure across here. And we get 1, which is 19.9, so it's 20. And then we can come here. Here's the papillary muscle. Here would be the papillary muscle cord junction. So if we drop sort of a perpendicular here, if we had a tangent, we'll get 19.4. So there's no question there's left ventricular hypertrophy. There's no question that it's extreme. And there's no question that it's concentric. This is not the picture that we see with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So let's flip through some of these and see what we can make out. There's our left atrium. We can drop a line on the left atrium, sort of perpendicular, and we'll say it's, ele it's elevated. So it's greater than 40, 45.7. So we have left atrial enlargement, goes along with the EKG, goes along with the echo. Good correlation. Here's the foramen ovale area. You can see how that's normally thinned. Here's the right coronary. Here's the left anterior descending, circumflex just to get some idea of what the coronaries look like. Right coronary is coming back towards the aorta here. Here's the left anterior descending, coming this way. This is, does not have a navigator, so we have not synchronized this with respiration. So you're going to see distortion of the coronaries from motion artifact from respiration. We do have a gait, though. But the gait we have is not a respiratory gait. It's a gate for the EKG. So you can see the bronchus dilation. You can see uh, the division here, carina. Uh, black blood, I'm sorry. We're looking at pulmonary artery. So correction, pulmonary artery, aorta, descending aorta, pure vena cava, correction. When you see black, you always, uh, because of CT, you think of uh, it being air and uh, being lung uh, like this, but it's uh, black blood that we're looking at. So uh, basically, we're looking at pulmonary artery bifurcation. And there's right ventricular outflow tract and so, so forth. So let's go take a look at some left ventricular function. So this is a markedly hypertrophied left ventricle. It's almost like that spade sign that you see in patients that have the hypertrophied apex or tunnel left ventricle, like you see in the Japanese have reported uh, the spade sign in left ventricular diastole and systole. And, uh, but un you can certainly say that this is more than just apical hypertrophy. This is all ventricular hypertrophy. And so we've got the apex, we've got the septum, we've got the posterior wall. Every bit of the left ventricle is thickened. Here's the mitral valve. You see a little puff of mitral regurgitation, not much. The left atrial enlargement. We can suppose that there is diastolic dysfunction when you see a ventricle this thick. There's no way it's going to have a normal filling curve. And that's going to cause backward increase in pressure during diastole, which is going to stretch the left atrium, which is going to cause left atrial enlargement. The next thing to expect would be PACs or atrial fibrillation. So we got good contractility, very impressed with the left ventricular hypertrophy. So there's that one. And then here is a two chamber coming up looks the same let's put this one up here and that's the black blood and here's another image and again this particular image is like a four chamber so we see left atrium right atrium right ventricle left ventricle and we don't see a, a problem with the left ventricular outflow tract. 
we can sort of move through this slowly. And we got systole. And during systole, you can see this sort of sac where you have systolic anterior cordy uh, motion that's coming in approximation of the septum and narrowing the outflow tract. But uh, it's not the mitral valve, it's the cord that's pulled over. Mitral valve is here, the cord, so it's not SAM, it's more of a sac. We see that commonly in patients with left ventricular hypertrophy. We'll play this again. And we'll look at the next image. So that's a good opportunity for you to see what our images look like. And these are great images. And uh, the next images are going to be a sequence of images called the short stack. And so what we do is we make a stack of images. Uh, and this is starting at the base mitral valve, moving down to papillary muscles, moving down to the apex, and what we're doing is making a, and you can see the torsion of the left ventricle, so we're making a stack of motion of left ventricular contractility, diastole and systole, to be able to accommodate our drawing systolic and diastolic endocardial and epicardial markers, both systolic and diastolic, to be able to calculate the ejection fraction. And you can see why this is the gold standard for ejection fraction. That this is probably about as good as you can get in terms of being able to measure the left ventricular contractility, systole and diastole, and calculate an ejection fraction because we've got the whole heart, the whole left ventricle, and we can go slice by slice working our way down. And so it does show pan left ventricular hypertrophy throughout the left ventricle. Right ventricle might be a little thick over here. It should just be a couple millimeters in thickness. And so during diastole, the right ventricle is not just a couple millimeters. So the right ventricle appears to me to actually be thickened over here. If you want to do an average of that, you'll get about, oh, maybe four and a half, five, which is abnormal. So let's look, uh, so you've seen the stack from which we calculate the ejection fraction. There's another four-chamber view, more of a pure four-chamber view. And this is really pretty. Where we line up, tricuspid valve, the mitral valve, slight left atrial enlargement, little puff of mitral regurgitation, and we can actually measure the amount of mitral regurgitation by calculating the ejection fraction and the stroke volume of the right ventricle and that of the left ventricle and subtracting them and uh, seeing what the difference is. So we've got like four ways to calculate the amount of mitral regurgitation. Pericardial sac looks nice. I don't see any abnormalities of that. More black blood looking at the myocardium. It's like a, sort of a two-chamber left ventricular outflow track image. Got some artifact. Don't worry about that. It looks normal otherwise except for left ventricular hypertrophy. And so we like to see, in every way we can see, right ventricular and left ventricular activity to be able to make the measurements we want. And you can see 
the aorta, superior vena cava, right atrium, tricuspid valve, right ventricle, right ventricular outflow tract, and the beginning of the common pulmonary artery. And let me pull some more images down for you. These are beautiful images. This tells you what we can find out. And uh, let me stop this and we'll scroll through here. Looks like a look locker. We're trying to null the left ventricle. And once we get it nulled, then we're going to do late gadolinium enhancement. So let's see what else we have here. And that's what we're doing. Look locker, nulling the left ventricle. And uh, sometimes it's difficult to null. And uh, this, we're trying to make it perfectly black. And we're having some trouble because look how speckled it is. And uh, we're having difficulty. We had difficulty with this one nulling and the case before nulling. And so we couldn't figure out if it was a function of the coil, uh, function of the patient, function of the tech, but we can't make this whole thing black. It's not nulling correctly. This whole thing should be finally black, but we just can't quite get it where it needs to be. And so that is a problem. And so we talked to the tech, we looked at the equipment, we looked at the coil, and we're trying to get a late gadolinium image not working and so we can't we can't deal with this and so Dr. Morales was there that day and we had this in two consecutive patients so we bought a new coil I think he berated the tech a little bit and this is a inconclusive study at this point in terms of late gadolinium enhancement and that we just can't get it right. And so we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's go back to our slide deck. So the conclusion here is, uh, as you saw, normal left ventricular contractility, no regional wall motion abnormalities, Severe thickening of the left ventricle. I don't think it's asymmetric from my measurements. No systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. I thought there was a little cordy uh, sac, systolic anterior motion. Normal RV size function, but it was a little thickened. The RV was about four and a half. Severe left atrial enlargement. Well, it didn't look so severe. It was enlarged. Moderate right atrial enlargement. Homogeneous perfusion on the rest images, and I didn't show you that part. Inability to evaluate for scarring due to suboptimal nulling in the myocardium on several repeat studies. We don't, I mean, you can't null with amyloid, but here's two patients in a row we couldn't null. And so you can't have two patients coming in back to back that have amyloid. That's too rare. And so we said it's a function of our equipment. Let's get a new coil and uh, bring people back and see if we can figure this out. So that was our problem. No, we've got a patient with severe LVH. Does he have amyloid? Does he have athletic heart? Kind of extreme for that. Does he have a form of hypertrophic left ventricular dysfunction with diastolic dysfunction? Does he have idiopathic LVH, which you'll see in your practice Occasional. I can remember, they're so occasional that I can remember who they are. So you'll see one or two idiopathic LVH. That everything you do is normal. 24-hour blood pressures are normal, and uh, they've got LVH. So that's going to happen. Uh, and so what do we do? What do we treat with? Should we do biopsy, uncontrolled hypertension, blood pressure monitor, which we have a 24-hour monitor? Should we monitor the Holter and LVH can precipitate arrhythmias, and we worry about ventricular tachycardia. Allopurinol. Have you heard of allopurinol for treating idiopathic or treating any kind of left ventricular hypertrophy? Yeah, there certainly was a couple articles with diabetic 
and ischemic heart disease who people were treated with allopurinol and there was regression of left ventricular hypertrophy. I'm not sure what that's all about or if it's been duplicated by any other group. We did a Holter monitor and we got some PVCs and they're 92,840 beats in uh, almost 24 hours and we had uh, only 821 ventricular ectopic beats of which most of them were isolated. There weren't any significant runs of any note. It was one run of four beats, big deal. And so some bigeminy and a few scattered PACs and uh, not very impressive, certainly not worrisome, no malignant uh, arrhythmias from the ventricle. No complex ventricular ectopy would be another conclusion. No pauses of any note. It's a 24-hour blood pressure monitor. We got these kind of pressures. Not quite sure what to make of this. Well, you know, this is supposed to be sleeping, and you're supposed to be a night dipper. Definitely not a night dipper. Definitely this is all abnormal. And so what was this? Why do we see 200? Why is it dipping? And so we said, well, maybe there's a problem with this monitor. And you always come back to, what's wrong with your equipment? And so we did have tested with blood pressure recording by hand, manually, with automatic blood pressure recording. We tested on other people. We tested on our physician's assistant. And we did find a malfunction and uh, an artifact of 46 millimeters of mercury. And so we had to throw the whole thing out and uh, send the 24-hour blood pressure monitor to uh, the factory to be checked. So much for that. Galactin-3 blood test for diastolic dysfunction in uh, people who have left ventricular hypertrophy. And uh, this is some information about the use of that. And that was a recently developed test that was available. And so we said, let's take a look at that and see what it looks like. And we got 14.6. Doesn't seem to be abnormal when you look at all these numbers. And that's looking for fibrosis. And a repeat echo in 2015 uh, showed that the RV systolic pressure still was within the limits of normal. The ejection fraction was normal. Septum, different measurements, same machine, same person. Not sure why. Uh, and so we still got left ventricular hypertrophy. It's still concentric. Patients' blood pressure medications were switched. Allopurinol was unsuccessful in regression. Patients started on verapamil, had some shortness of breath on exertion, felt tired and fatigued, switched to amlodipine. So the usual of trying different blood pressure modalities to see what we could do for him to control his blood pressure with the 24-hour blood pressure recording uh, unavailable because the machine was being repaired. Repeat echo. 2016. Hang on, we'll show you an echo.
So, here we go. This is the last CMR. We got one more echo. Oh, good. Yeah. Now let's go again, and so I don't see all the images here, so I don't see the survey where you find out where the left ventricle is, so uh, let's just skip that. Oh, here it is. Here's our survey, and we've got it coronal, sagittal, and axial, sagittal. Looks like the heart we know well on this patient, recognized by how it's muscle bound. Black blood study, nice for measuring. Over here, there's your septum. 19, consistent with the echo. Posterior wall, 22. Go up here and measure a little bit. 23. So we got a thickened left ventricle, as you know. You look at the right ventricle. Right ventricle is thick. That's not a normal right ventricle. It's supposed to be a couple millimeters, paper thin. Left atrium over here. We'll drop a perpendicular right there 50 left atrium's gotten bigger right atrium coming over here somewhere that's big coronaries present can't tell a lot about them other than there's the main left left anterior descending circumflex circumflex down here Following it around. Let's take a look at some contractility. We like things to be moving, especially the heart. And so it looks like that it's maybe a little less than there was before in terms of contractility. We'll see what kind of measurements we got. Again, the gold standard, a little mitral regurgitation. Four chamber view, little TR, little MR, more of same. Outflow track, definitely not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Definitely not. Definitely not tunnel left ventricle or apical hypertrophy. Very pretty pictures. No aortic valve disease of any significance. Right ventricular outflow track. It's a good chance to look at the right ventricle and decide about the thickness. And so if you get sort of off the trabeculae and see what we can measure in right ventricular thickness. For me, if you can measure it and it's got something measurable it's abnormal because usually it's so thin like the pericardium it's not measurable and so that's abnormal and here we go probably looking at TW2 weighted and then no edema same there. Looks like a contrast study, right? Not a con not a contrast study. Uh, it's a T1 W. And so we get these pictures, try to null it, and let's see at the success rate of nulling it. Still difficulty nulling it. So let's look at the images after it's nulled, after late gadolinium enhancement. And so we do see very 
since we did have trouble knowing it, we believed what we had because we had new coil, we had everything functioning correctly, we nulled the patient before, nulled the patient after, and so we had difficulty nulling this one with the look locker, where this is supposed to be totally black, and see, I can't make it totally black. So this is the problem. Unfortunately, this is the problem with amyloid disease. And how come we had this problem before on this patient? Well, he obviously has amyloid disease. Well, why would he have a problem with two patients in a row? Well, both of them had amyloid disease. What's the odds of seeing two patients on the same day back to back with amyloid disease? I'm not sure. I mean, we were at tertiary referral center for MRI, but most people don't send people for MRI. They just feel it doesn't exist. So they just do echoes, but it's certainly, it's the procedure of choice for amyloid. And so we had two patients back to back with amyloid disease. And indeed, this gentleman has amyloidosis. We can't null it. And actually you might be able to get some semblance of how much amyloid he has. So this should all be black. So now we're at the late gadolinium enhancement stage, and all of this white stuff in here is amyloid disease. And what you don't see is amyloid disease too. Even the papillary muscle is amyloid. So the white stuff is late gadolinium enhancement throughout the left ventricle, epicardium, myocardium, sort of down to almost endocardium, papillary muscle, some areas we don't see it. That doesn't mean it's not there. That means it's just not there in great bulk. So let's look at these carefully. And let's look at the other ones. Ah, here we go. And so all of this white stuff seen in here, this should be totally black, is amyloidosis. How about the right ventricle? Yep, there it is. So that explains the right ventricular thickening because of amyloidosis. So two patients, same day, back to back, amyloidosis, and we thought we had dysfunctional technologist or dysfunctional coil, and in fact, our failure to null was that both patients on the look locker had amyloid disease, and now instead of seeing a totally black myocardium, we see all the late gadolinium enhancement seen with amyloid disease. And so now we have a diagnosis. Took a while to get there because of the happenstance of two patients back to back coming with amyloid heart disease and our failure to be able to null the left ventricle. But let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. And Delayed enhancement with circumferential, subendocardial, non-coronary distribution, most likely cardiac amyloid. Severe concentric left ventricular thickening. I don't know if technically the word left ventricular hypertrophy is appropriate now because the left ventricle isn't hypertrophy. What we're not seeing, we're not seeing left ventricular muscle that's thickened. What we're seeing is abnormality positive material in the myocardium that uh, basically is causing it to be thickened. Normal contractility at this point is a good thing of both LV and RV. I can see why there would be biatrial bi enlargement. One, because of probably the most severe is because of the diastolic dysfunction. Mitral valve is open, left ventricular in diastolic pressure is high. Even early diastolic pressure is high. And so that's reflected across the mitral valve during diastole in the left atrium, causing stretching of the left atrium, and so left atrial dilatation. Same thing's happening on the right side, because the right ventricle also is uh, thickened, not right ventricular hypertrophy, but right ventricular thickening, causing the right atrium to get bigger because of diastolic pressures. EKG, well, you think of with amyloid heart disease, low voltage. I certainly can't say there's low voltage in the precordial leads. Certainly there's conduction defects, which you, you would have, which would you expect because amyloid doesn't conduct like Purkinje fibers and like conduction tissue. 
and so we're going to have abnormal conduction just because stuff is in there and it doesn't conduct well for electricity and so we do have low voltage over here in the standard leads so they certainly wouldn't expect that from left ventricular hypertrophy here's a PAC over here atrial fibrillation would be very detrimental to this patient with diastolic dysfunction but we can look for it because we expect there to be quite a bit of left atrial dispersion because there's going to be amyloid, amyloid in the left atrium as well and then some left atrial fibrosis we have an echo image hang on and we'll get that for you So imaging is the ball game for evaluating patients with amyloid heart disease. Actually, the papillary muscles look funny there. See, look, that's looking funny. The septum, actually, now, now that you see it, you start thinking, well, things don't look right. You know, it doesn't look like it's homogeneous myocardium. The septum looks much stronger in terms of echoes and speckles and this papillary muscle has much stronger brighter look to it uh, and not unlike what you saw when we did the late gadolinium enhancement so I think there are other hints that we can see here let's roll through this a little bit aortic valve right-sided pressures left-sided mitral regurgitation left atrium contractility there's not a lot of room here here's the mitral gurge still minimal certainly not hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it looks funny it looks kind of speckled doesn't look exactly the way everybody looks so there is some tissue interrogation that's involved in looking at the walls and it doesn't look right so let's go back to our PowerPoint and these are our conclusive echo serial measurements showing that this has gotten thicker and the ejection fraction appears to have declined a little bit doesn't look like there's a lot of room if this gets thicker and this gets thicker then there's not going to be a lot of room for systol for diastolic volume and so the stroke volume is going to decrease so it's not surprising that uh, the ejection fraction is dropped at this point the RV systolic pressure has gone up not pathological but you can see it's going up stepwise in diastolic volume it's not going to be very great because uh, it can't fill and so that makes sense everything makes sense I'm still calling it mild to moderate mitral regurgitation so let's see what's the plan at this time and uh, how do we how do we differentiate amyloid heart disease now that we've gotten this far and made a diagnosis which unfortunately took a while because of our bungling around with the MRI so let's hear uh, what Dr. Tariq's research has, has to tell us about how we can stage this and how we can tell more about the patient so I guess for this patient the plan was um, to get a biopsy and some other tests to see if we can diagnose the amyloid and see what kind of amyloid it is. At the same time, we also did some tests to see uh, if we can get some prognosis on the patient while he was getting some of these things done. So we looked at the uh, light chains, the serum-free light chains, the troponin T and the BNP. The troponin T and the BNP were both elevated, but uh, his light chains were actually within normal range. So uh, what kind of amyloid it was it's kind of hard to tell from this one but he does seem to have some biomarkers which kind of point towards a more poor prognosis um, the patient also so these this is some of the workup that he's supposed to be getting so he's supposed to be getting some quantitative immunoglobulins serum urine pro protein electrophoresis to look for some monoclonal pro uh, gammopathy uh, immunofixation electrophoresis also CT of the chest abdomen and pelvis to see if he has the same amyloid somewhere else in the body and then based on the results of these along with the other tests the lab studies the next step would be to get either a bone marrow biopsy 
or maybe an umbilical fat pad biopsy and then see what happens with that. So then I'll just shift quickly to amyloidosis. I'll try to speed up and uh, because we don't have much time. So again, amyloidosis is general term where you have extracellular tissue deposition of fibrils, which are made up of proteins, many of them which can actually be found in the plasma. Now, the deposits can range, and the clinical manifestations can range based on what type of uh, amyloid you have, its location, and the amount. And so these are all the different types that I could find on up-to-date and have to do with apolipoproteins or immunoglobulins, or maybe you have neuroendocrine markers, even cytoskeletal components or transport proteins, coagulation proteins, and so on. Here you have galactin also there. Yeah, and so you have all the different types again, and then you have the clinical type, which is usually associated with them. So you have types which have the, which are the more common ones, the AL, which is the primary or myeloma associated. You also have another common one, which is like amyloid complicating because of chronic infections and inflammatory diseases. You have other ones which have to do with uh, dialysis and so on. This one, A beta 2M protein is what's involved in there and so on. So type of uh, amyloidosis, the most common ones that, that you see clinically are the AL or the primary and the AA, which is the secondary, which has to do with inflammatory and infectious diseases. Some of the other common ones have to do with dialysis or heritable amyloidosis where an abnormal protein is being made by the liver and that's what's forming the amyloid. Also age-related senile or organ-specific amyloid. Uh, the presentation, as I mentioned, depends on where the deposition is and what kind of protein it is and how much you have. So on the skin, you can look at waxy skin, easy bruising, musculoskeletal. You can have pseudohypertrophy because it's not really muscle which hypertrophy. It's just the presence of the amyloid itself that's making the muscle thick. You can also have some joint issues, carpal tunnel syndrome, spondyloarthropathy, and um, other joints basically being affected by it. Heart, uh, we look at uh, heart failure, where it's sort of like diastolic dysfunction because of the thickening, abnormal filling. You can also actually have an anginal kind of picture where you can have amyloid in the coronary circulation, you can, which can actually lead to infarction. You can have conduction disease. GI, you can have enlarged organs like hepatomegaly, splenomegaly. Renal, you can have proteinuria as severe as going all the way up to nephrotic syndrome and also neuropathies, you can get dementia, you can get, you can even have stroke, both hemorrhagic and ischemic. Uh, and hematologic, you can have impaired coagulation because of this. Amyloid heart disease, because our focus is on the heart, so the, there's a bunch of different types of amyloid which are associated with this. AL, as I mentioned, being the most common. Secondary, because of inflammatory infections, also being a common one, or you have a familial or senile, also as another type which is seen. Cardiac involvement in general is considered to have a poor prognosis, and I'll mention the prognosis at the end. Some of the manifestations, as previously discussed, heart failure, so you can have shortness of breath, edema, small vessel disease, uh, you can have angina, myocardial infarction, you can have patients developing syncope and sudden death because of uh, arrhythmias, other conduction system disease, air fibrillation, and so on, pericardial disease, and thromboembolism and stroke because it might be related to some of the arrhythmias that are caused and so on. So diagnosis, as I mentioned, uh, you can get a hint from it based on history, some clinical manifestations or some non-invasive imaging, like in our case it was the MRI that uh, was concerning for amyloidosis. That's when we first knew or made the diagnosis. Lab studies, you start to do to see how much the disease has spread, what other sites you have amyloid in. So you can go any all urinalysis or CBC, BMP, P, blood studies, liver tests, you know, or the cardio, cardiac markers, some endocrine studies. Again, imaging that you may look at is echocardiography, CT, chest, abdomen, MRI. There's also this other test, uh, scintigraphy with radioisotope label, serum, amyloid, P component. That's another test to see what organs may be affected by amyloidosis. Um, further on, What's important here is that AL amyloidosis is suspected in patients who may not have any other chronic infectious or inflammatory disease, it's any end-stage renal disease that may give uh, be raise suspicion of dialysis. 
and uh, our family history amyloidosis, so no familial causes. So you kind of look towards AL, the primary amyloidosis as being the cause, which I think was the case in our patient. AL amyloidosis is suspected in a patient um, who also maybe have non-diabetic nephrotic range proteinuria, restrictive cardiomyopathy, which may, is unexplained. An increase in uh, BNP in the absence of any kind of heart disease, unexplained edema, hepatosplenomegaly, carpal tunnel, some of, the, some of the other findings which are sort of unexplained, then you think of primary amyloidosis as being the cause. And diagnosis, as I mentioned, if the, if the patient does not, if the patient ha has no other indication and he doesn't really have a well-known or documented plasma cell dysphagia, then the testing is aimed to look for some problem like that. So you would do urine or serum protein electrophoresis. You try to look at the light chain immunoglobulins and see if you can detect any abnormal levels. Uh, based on all the results, all the previous results, then you decide on where you want to do a biopsy. And this is also depends on how safe the procedure is, how sensitive the results are going to be, and what organs are actually involved. Abdominal fat pad is preferred uh, in uh, primary amyloidosis because it is least likely to lead to serious bleeding. But the problem with this is that it may be less sensitive than some of the other biopsies that you can do. Bone marrow is a second preferred choice and you have all these organs that can also be used. If the patient only has one organ that's affected then obviously you're probably just going to use that specific site for biopsy. Histopathology, the idea here is once you have the biopsy you want to identify the amyloid and you want to know which specific type of amyloid it is. You can do congruent staining, you can do H&E staining, you can look at the actual configuration in electron microscopy, immunohistology, look at antibodies against the amyloid. You can do sequencing of the amino acids or you can do mass spectrometry where you would break down the proteins or, or uh, amino acids into small chains and then try to identify um, based on that what kind of amyloid it is. Um, the treatment is aimed at the underlying cause of the amyloid deposition. Um, and the, so for infectious and inflammatory disorders, you're going to try and target those. So in the case of rheumatoid arthritis, you might look at some biologic agents. Uh, you might want to try chemotherapy for plasma cell dyskasias, multiple myelomas. You can go for metformin or, metformin or uh, some steroids and so on. Liver transplantation for hereditary causes because that's the liver, the liver is the cause of the abnormal protein that's causing the amyloid, so you maybe try and think of liver transplantation. You use, look for a different way of doing the dialysis or even renal transplantation in patients who may have dialysis-associated amyloidosis. Depending on how severe the end organ damage is, you might also think of transplantation of some of the organs that are affected. A uh, patient is much uh, a better candidate if it's a single organ that's affected, usually. Um, uh, there's also some immunotherapy, some antibodies that are now being studied that might uh, hasten the degradation of these deposits. Also some drugs are used to stabilize the precursor molecules so that they do not break down and give rise to some byproducts which can then coagulate and form amyloid. Um, for Specifically for amyloid heart disease, one of the manifestations as previously mentioned was heart failure. So you can use loop diuretics here. That's like the mainstay of ther therapy. Aldosterone antagonists can also be used. Beta blockers generally worsen condition because the reason here is there's a very low and fixed stroke volume. So if you cannot change the stroke volume, you do not want to reduce the heart volume and further decrease the cardiac output. ACE inhibitors and ARBs, it's not really clear what kind of uh, um, benefit they have. It's been per it's been said in literature that uh, it can actually lead to profound hypertension. Calcium channel blockers are ineffective because, again, it's not a myocardial cellular dysfunction. It's actually the deposition of the amyloid that's causing the diastolic dysfunction. Uh, the joxin, there's a higher uh, susceptibility to toxicity because there's some concern that the amyloid might bind to the joxin and stabilize it more, make it last longer, I guess. Um, heart transplant and ventricular assist devices may be used um, also, atrial fibrillation can be one of the conduction defects that you can get. So you might, uh, or the, uh, the treatment for that would be just simply low-dose beta blockers, using amiodarone to maintain sinus rhythm. You can use careful digoxin. Again, beta blockers, you want to be careful. You don't want to 
reduce the heart rate too much. Digoxin, you want to be careful because you do not want to lead to toxicity. Anticoagulation is also important, especially if the patient ends up developing atrial fibrillation. What's important here is the CHADS VASC score is not of any value. All patients with amyloidosis are considered at high risk, and so they are they should be anticoagulated. Even in normal sinus rhythm patients, you can sometimes think of anticoagulation based on left atrial appendage velocity, depressed, and some A-wave abnormalities. Other arrhythmias you got to be on the lookout for. That's why we did the whole tomato in our patient. And these can lead to syncope or sudden cardiac death. And in these patients, it has been shown that uh, prophylactic ICD is actually not good because they have electromechanical dissociation and the ICD use does not seem to actually benefit these patients in terms of outcomes. Um, once you put the patients on therapy, then again you go through some of the same tests that you did before in the initial assessment of the patient to try and see how the amyloid is doing, whether it's gotten better or not. Um, again, looking at some of the other biomarkers, cardiac biomarkers, looking at light chains and so on or even looking at non-invasive imaging to see how the amyloid deposition looks. Prognosis, there's been a few different um, methods or models that have been proposed. Mayo score, I think, was one of the older ones where you look at cardiac biomarkers. Revised one also added on for serum light chains to it, and it said it performs better than the Mayo score. The other one is you also use uric acid along with the cardiac biomarkers to see how the patient uh, stands. Uh, there's also another new uh, model that is kind of out there which looks at visual assessment basically based on the late gadolinium enhancement, the extent of it during MRI. And um, basically what that one, this is just an image from that paper that talked about it, and it actually says patients who have more gadolinium enhancement like in the sense that you have more just amyloid in the heart, transmural, compared to subendocardial, compared to nothing these tend to have a worse prognosis. So they looked at two different types of amyloid in the uh, amyloidosis patient, and that's what the, basically the findings that they had from that. And so that's basically it, and these are some of the references um, to, um, to, so that you can go ahead and take a look at the amyloidosis and learn about it. And so that uh, ends our presentation today. Uh, hey, Mary. How are you, Mary Daniels? Good. Good. And yourself? Uh, very well. Very well. What's what's going on with uh, with you guys? Well, I think uh, a lot of the crew is at Hims in Orlando. Oh, everybody. Uh, they left for... 40,000 people over there. Yeah, so, yeah. So Paul and that whole crew is over in Orlando now for him. So I would imagine it's wrapping up pretty quick. Oh, uh, IBM uh, has a big presence over there. I noticed. Oh, I think so. Yeah, the Watson. Yeah, they made the announcement of uh, our association with Watson and the addition of, uh, I guess, uh, not eight, eight others, and McKesson joined in too, which is your old. It's, that would be McKesson yeah. Imaging, which is your old uh, CEO. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we're pretty tied up pretty close with McKesson um, as far as PAX integration goes. Yeah. So that sounds pretty interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, I should plan on going to that meeting next time. Is it always in Orlando or does it move around? Uh, I'm not certain about that. My, I, I'm not certain. It's got to be either in Chicago or Orlando, I would think, with the uh, number of people. Oh yeah, well, that's hosting. A... I'm not sure. Or maybe it was in Vegas too one year. Oh yeah. Well, that is huge. That's a huge me. I can't believe yeah. how IT has proliferated in the in the medical healthcare industry. It's just huge. I mean, IT. You go to like ISIS Healthcare, and you find IT all of a sudden is taking over a whole floor, and you walk down the hall, and there's like a hundred people you haven't seen before that you don't know, and you say, like, Yeah. Great. What do you guys do it? And then you find they're spending another fifty million dollars uh, buying some uh, another computer system and dumping what they already had in the hospital that we just rolled out, you know, five years ago, and we're moving on to another system. It's just amazing the amount of money that's being spent on IT and uh, in terms of people and hardware and software. 
Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we never got our money's worth on anything because we were it was <laughs> mandated that we do it, and so they could sell us you know crap, and so we bought crap mm -hmm. because everybody had to meet their deadlines, and so that's right. They didn't have anything. You so. know, it's interesting. We were at a conference um, not last week, the week before. Yeah. And it was a radiology conference, and we had just kind of a mini MAB, and um, Osama spoke a lot on deep learning. And I'll tell you, the heads kind of went up, and you could just kind of see the world, wheels turning and, uh, you know, thinking about how to utilize this type of technology. Yeah, so we're thinking Andrew Nig, his last name is NG, Andrew Nig, who's at Baidu. We're thinking basically that uh, he's pretty, he's been pretty much right about this. He think he says it's like electricity. You know, when we adopted electricity, we had refrigeration, we had lots of things moving around that weren't moving before, and uh, there went the horses, and all of a sudden we've got electric lights, and this is becoming a like electricity for us. In terms yeah, really. I mean, you know, we really are in a technology revolution. Oh my gosh! It's just it's it's so amazing. You know, when you think about it, and 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 you know, just kind of being in the midst of it every day to day, everything going on, and then when you sit down and really think.